Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter of HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for Thursday afternoon now, the 21st of September, 2017. Let's take a look at something we haven't visited in a while, and that is the sea surface temperature anomalies. Check out this La Nina that is coming on, completely unexpected. Remember, we thought, well, there might be an El Nino this year. <laughs> well, quite the opposite, wouldn't you say? That's pretty impressive. And we will just have to see how long this lingers and what it might mean for the upcoming winter. Remember, even though there aren't any hurricanes in the northern hemisphere, uh, at least around North America, in the winter, usually, uh, I do study and go into or intercept. I just don't like the word chase. I don't chase anything. You know what I mean? It's like, that's just not the right word. But anyway, um, I'm a big fan of nor'easters. I think that they are just as fascinating. Uh, you get the ones that come through with a clipper system and they develop like this. And then you get the ones that come down and then they turn up the coast like that. And, you know, winter's coming. Uh, as the meme suggests from time to time, you've seen that. Brace yourselves, winter's coming. And so this La Nina will figure into that. And, um, and then, you know, once we get into December... We will start watching this very, very closely to see what it does for next year. Uh, but that's next year. Right now, the main development region and the Caribbean Sea all running above normal. The subtropical Atlantic, for the most part, also above normal temperature-wise. And above normal temperature-wise up here, for the most part, in the northwest Atlantic. There are a few cold anomaly pockets, like right there. But, you know, really the Atlantic Basin running above the long-term average, especially down here in the deep tropics, and this is the year where it really did matter. And notice here the very warm water compared to average in the uh, Western Caribbean and even parts of the Gulf slightly warmer than they should be for this time of year. But anyway, haven't visited this in a while, so I figured we'd take a look and see where things stand. All right, speaking of where things stand... Here is Jose, and Jose probably holds the key to what happens with Maria. And you can clearly see the center of circulation with Jose, and this was um, several hours ago, I do believe, noon roughly, uh, when I saved this picture. And then here's what it looks like just recently. And this is about 2.30 or so. Uh, so not much change overall, maybe drifting ever so slightly to the east over here. And we will see what happens with this, because I think that if it comes south and west and just kind of gets buried down here, um, it's easily going to turn Maria out to sea. They're just going to kind of uh, Fujiwara around each other, and it's very difficult to explain what that means. But if this goes this way, then Maria really doesn't have a choice but to go that way. And the two sort of pivot around each other around a common center, you know, somewhere out here, so to speak. And they just can't occupy the same space. And, you know, they don't collide and become some superstorm. There's just no such thing as that, that that I've ever seen. But they do rotate around each other in sort of a fashion like that, around a common axis or a center where one cyclone will go this way and the other cyclone will go this way. And we see that more often than not in the Pacific. But anyway, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't think it will. If we look at the animation here of the East Coast uh, visible satellite shot, you see that for the most part, Jose generally stationary, maybe drifting southward. Uh, but the key will be to see if it heads out here and just kind of dissipates over the colder water of the Atlantic. If so, then that's going to allow the ridging to come back over the top and or to the north of Maria and allow the ridging down here to be a little bit stronger and nose its way in more. And then Maria will get to get... Uh, will be allowed to track closer to the United States. At least that's the theory that I have. And so that's why I say it's not set in stone just yet. Uh, this afternoon it's trying to build itself back up. The island of Hispaniola really influencing and blocking some of that inflow. But once it gets up here past the Turks and Caicos and turns north more, out over the open water here where water temperatures are plenty warm, they have not been disturbed too much. Um, Maria should have a chance maybe to become a Category 4 hurricane once again. Uh, why not? It already overachieved. Why can't it 
you know, reach its maximum potential in the Southwest Atlantic like it did in the Caribbean. We'll see. I don't see it becoming like some monster Category 5 again. Just conditions aren't going to allow, I don't believe. But it wouldn't surprise me if it gets up to 130, 140 miles per hour. Let's just put it that way. Looking at the Hurricane Center forecast track, now this certainly suggests clearly that Maria comes up and turns out, you know, I mean, maybe it goes on like this, and that's it. Um, so I'm going to just show you a little bit of evidence against that. And it's not an argument that the Hurricane Center is wrong. It's just showing that the error cone here is there for a reason. Let's just put it that way. And so, you know, the center could be anywhere within this cone during the four- and five-day time frame, even three days out. I mean, 72 hours out in model land. Remember, even though you can't use a past event all the time, like Irma or Matthew last year, to bolster an argument, I'm just pointing out we remember what we all, quote, knew three days before Irma sort of kissed the coast of Cuba here and then moved up like that and stayed inland. We all remember that when at three days out um, it looked like Irma was going to come up and maybe do something like this. And, you know, that's enough of a difference over there. Yeah, we remember. So just saying, that's it. You know, just kind of it, the, the guidance isn't perfect. Let's just put it that way. So let's get rid of this because we need to make room for lots and lots of tabs here. All of these, courtesy of Levi Cowan's website, tropicaltidbits.com, we will compare the European, the ECMWF, versus the GFS. So this is the initial condition uh, on the European, the ECMWF 12Z run. There's Maria, there's Jose, and you can see this trough trying to dig out here off the west coast. This will amplify bring cold air and snow and everything to the Rockies, and it will also amplify the ridge up here over the northeast United States and southeast Canada. So let's move through, and I'll show you. All right, so that we'll get rid of this because the initial is all set. There's 24 hours, 48, 72, 96, and you say, yep, there it goes. It's starting to move to the northeast. We go back to 72 to 96, and you see what's happening with Jose that uh, the European sort of kills it off and it scoots it south and then over to here. All right? And you have this uh, height in the atmosphere up here. The 500 millibar heights are sufficient that if Jose was not there at all, this would likely be stronger and farther to the south, and Maria would be coming up probably a lot like that. So certainly there is a positive influence on the track in terms of keeping it away from the United States, Maria that is, from Jose. Uh, no question about it. So that's 96. And then at 120, moving north, northeast or so, and Jose is just a remnant low sitting up here. And there are some building heights, you know, not necessarily, put it this way, you don't have a big trough dipping in just yet. In fact, the trough is way out here. You can clearly see that. You have ridging you know, back over this way, but will it be enough? Now, this is five days out in time. Five days out. I mean, so much can happen. And it's true, I'm not just saying that to say it. Five days out. I mean, my goodness, a lot can happen. So let's go on to day six, and you say, uh-oh, there you go. So day seven, still sitting there. One week out. Are you kidding me? You know how much can change in that time frame that Maria could be all like that, for goodness sakes. Absolutely. But what's more likely to happen? I mean, we don't have, there is some energy up here, you know, trying to dig in and, you know, but we don't have this big longitudinal deep trough trying to come out and just sweep this away. You can clearly see that in the model here. But this is a week out. So if we just go back. You know, hour 72, this is three days, four days, five days, six days, seven days. It's these right here, okay? You know, hour 120, 144, 168. You know, it's like, think about how different this could be. Maria could be out here, or it could be over here. I mean, there, that is not out of the realm of possibility for the model error 
and the spread of the ensembles shows that from the zero Z run. All right, so let's remember, um, I'm going to get rid of day three and day four. I'm going to keep days five, six, and seven. Now let's look at the GFS. Here's the GFS initial, 24, 48, 72, 96. All right, so 120, 144, 168. So let's just compare the GFS 168 with the Euro 168. So there's GFS, there's the Euro. Ah, <laughs> see what I mean? They don't match. They're not, you know, they're not in agreement with each other. And so we go back here and we look at the Euro 120 versus the GFS 120. GFS is farther to the east. The Euro is farther to the south and west. All right, and we can look at other things in here. What do we notice? Well, the GFS really has no Jose at all. And with no Jose at all, how is this farther to the east? So things just aren't adding up. You know what I'm saying? We got clues. It's like trying to solve a friggin' murder mystery, and we are the detectives, you know, together. I'm just the one talking about it in a video here. You can all see it. Uh, but look what's happening here. I mean, this is a deep trough out over the west, lowering heights all the way down to the Baja. You know, if this is stronger, and we're talking five days out, then this is going to be stronger. It's just how it works. And this will be much farther to the west, you know, relative to where it is in the models now. So you see what I'm saying here, people? This is like not done where it is absolutely going out to sea. So let me put it into basketball terms. I'm a big basketball fan. I love college basketball. To keep from having negative things said in the comments and whatever, I'm going to just be very generic. So your favorite team, Team A, you're rooting for them. You've been a fan of theirs forever. And uh, they're in a big game against the rival. And you're down 14 points with about three and a half minutes to go, and you have the ball. Uh, you're also, you know, number one, two, or three in the nation, whatever. You're a good powerhouse team. It's not looking very likely that you're going to win. You're down 14 with three and a half minutes, but you have the ball. There's a mathematical chance that you could win if certain things happen, but it's not looking very good. You understand that? I think we can all relate to that. Here's another way to look at it, and here is where I will get some <laughs> who knows what. A certain Atlanta Falcons were up over a certain New England Patriots by a huge margin going into the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. At one point, I saw on Twitter, I think it was from 538, that the Falcons had like a 98% chance of winning the Super Bowl at that point. And look how that turned out. Now, sports and meteorology have nothing to do with each other except for one thing, probability. Absolutely related. Probability and mathematics are the same throughout. Probability, if it's either 100% or it's not. So the Super Bowl was either over and the Falcons won, which they didn't, or it wasn't, and in which case it gave the Patriots time to come back. The team that's down 14 with three minutes to go in the college basketball game, could come back. But there's still three minutes on the clock. My point here as we wrap this up, and I hope you understand this, this is why I try to explain this the way people can wrap their brain around it. This right here is a week out. Are you serious? I mean, <laughs> I, I laugh because so much is put into the you know, it's going out to sea, and that's the end of it. And even the National Hurricane Center, you know, they don't do a seven-day forecast out for the public. Maybe they have one internally. But the cone of uncertainty is there because of the probability of where the center will be anywhere within that cone within the five days of the track forecast. And it has those errors out to 200-plus miles for a reason. And we're talking here at day seven, now, once again, I will say before I sign off, yes, Maria could be out here at this point in time. Yeah, I'm just shooting in the dark here. Or it could be over here. You know, seriously. 
it's seven days away, and it's like, oh wow, you know. Um, so stay tuned. It is it is not done, and of course, some of the other modeling does bring it into the North Carolina coast, Virginia coast, etc. The Canadian. Uh, just, I don't have time to show you everything, but these are the two most reliable for the most part. There's the UK Met, but that's I can't find that where I can show you graphically where it matches up like these. Um, and again, how much do you want to go over? We could be here for an hour. But these are the two bigger, you know, global models that we all know and love, GFS and the ECMWF. Very similar through three to four days and then some divergence. So there you have it. It's not over till it's over. Yogi Berra, right? Yankees. All right. Have a good rest of your afternoon. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thank you for tuning in. We'll visit this again tomorrow morning and see what the models show overnight. Have a great rest of your Thursday. I'll talk to you tomorrow morning.